Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm more or less like, I'll talk about the works I show in the show, and of course there's like a, a, a focus on this uh, computer game topic with Counter-Strike and the dust map, but uh, there's also other pieces, and I will show some, some more pictures so you get an like, idea of the body of work, of the mentioned body of work. I'm, uh, yeah, I, actually I studied architecture at the art school in Berlin, so I, I'm kind of like, yeah, come into art from, from a side set as many, as many other artists. Um, I was always like, already in school, we were kind of, kind of very free to do what we wanted to do, so there was very few architecture, a lot of internet, a lot of uh, 3D, and all kinds of things. So I started in 95 for school, and this was like right exactly the time when the web came up and all these interesting things happened. And at the same time, we still was, were learning how, how to draw with ink on paper. So and this is like, yeah, what they don't learn today anymore. Um, and it's, yeah, the, I have some, some introduction picture. This is a friend in New York. I'm currently away from my computer. Here's this t-shirt series going on for a while. Don't tag me in this photo. It's like, this is already, I mean, this is all like a couple of years ago, but this is um, very, became very normal, right? I mean, people, this whole question on, oh yeah, the, the overlaying question, how, how digital and internet and all this whole development affects our lives, uh, yeah, has, it's like, became obvious in the last, uh, I don't know, four or five years, two, three, four, five years. Um, yeah, it became strong and stronger. This is uh, just, it's like a picture of a commercial, but I think it's interesting because it's, it's also an old picture, but how symbolically the mobile phone is sort of imposed over the house, over the architecture, so they becoming more important than the house. Here's, uh, this is Potsdamer Platz, and this actually looks still the same. Um, and the house on the right side is just a scaffolding with a print on it to put advertising on it. And um, there's not even a construction site in the back. So they just built this fake house to kind of simulate the city. And when I see these things and come from computer games, I'm like, wait a second, like this is very much like a cube with a texture in 3D on it. But at the same time, yeah, this becomes real. So it's a lot about, I'm, I'm gonna go quickly through these projects, the, the well-known ones or yeah iconic projects. This is uh, Google Maps. You, you all know this. When you go to Google Maps, you can search for things. Uh, and the search results will be placed on the map of your city. This was done in Stettin in 2009. So uh, the, and here the question is, what, what is with this little red marker on there? How is it kind of... Uh, it's just an icon on the screen and it stays always the same size. You zoom in and you zoom out but at the same time is cast a shadow on the, on the satellite picture and the more you zoom in, the more you have the feeling this, this little icon becomes part of the city. So, and I was posing that question, so where is, where is this icon or what would it be like to merge this into uh, real life? This was done in uh, Taiwan, Taipei, a couple of years ago, but also uh, in France, in Arles, during the photo festival. And there's like there's these stories of, of when the the parcel service is asking me like on the phone, yeah, I can't I can't find your address, like you it's not existing. And I'm like, yeah, but I, I live here. Yeah, we couldn't find it on Google Maps. And and it's like this question, how how is our perception of city and public space uh, influenced by these services and also like uh, yeah, how I, I claim sort of the view on the city is also changing by that and all by, a lot by these geolocation services and obviously Google will not build these markers to put up in the city, it doesn't make sense for them, but they will sooner or later like uh, become also part of the advertising billboard, um, interactive billboard system I'm pretty sure because they have all the information about all of us and targeted marketing is on the internet works very well and this is like the next step, uh, the minority report idea of like bringing this or yeah, all the idea, bringing this into the city. So there's something going on here. Um, and this, like, this is one of the very classic examples how I take some elements or situations from 
digital space, online space, and kind of reintroduce them in, in physical space. So here is uh, another game project. This is World of Warcraft. And what's interesting is there's a big group of players. They all play from their home computer or over internet. And they solve a quest together. And they just killed this big blue dragon in the back. And um, it took them maybe like a whole weekend. So it's not just like a oh, little kid's game, whatever. It's really for them. It's they need to have certain skills, they need to coordinate, it's really like a, it's like a socially very strong group. And at the end they take a picture for a remembrance, right? Like it's like when you go with a group, with school or whatever, like for holidays, you take a picture for remembrance because it's, it's really important for them. So it's, um, yeah, so a lot about these questions, what, how important, which uh, platform, which reality is for you and so these kind of things become inherently part of our life for, for these people playing this. So I've done quite often this workshop called WOW. So the idea is that we build our real names uh, and then these names get mounted on a plastic strip and we walk our names, each other, on this pole in, in public space as if we were in a multiplayer online game. So you, and you can, of course, you can ask yourself, like, yeah, there's a lot play and gaming, uh, not gaming, but like role playing going on already, right? I mean, is life something like a most massively multiplayer online game? And um, at the same time, it also questions this whole development of how online, I mean, 10 years ago, well, there was no reason to leave my name online, or maybe 15 years ago. It already started, I guess, 10 years ago. But today, when you can't be found by name online, you're already suspect. I think one of the last um, Amag runs in the US, he was not on Facebook. So, and they're like, oh, yeah, well, this person was not on Facebook. So you're already a suspect when you're not on Facebook. And like in 2002, 2003, there was no, like, you had avatar names and that's it. So why would you put your real name? So there's a whole, like, a whole very fast development. And at the same time, when I walk down the street, I mean, I can, I can talk to people and get a conversation, maybe I can ask for a name. Or, but it's, there are certain rules which apply, like, in public space or how we, what we learned, how it's different in different cultural circles. But this, this is a, it's a very different development or the fast development of the web is, um, right? I mean, you, you don't strip naked on the street, but people strip naked on the internet, like this, like a, on chat roulette or whatever. So there's, there's uh, something, uh, yeah, something going on there. And this has a lot to do with, yeah, privacy and how we are perceived. And I don't know, Google Glasses are coming, so the name floating thing is sort of, could be next year, <laughs> maybe. And at the same time, this is very common for a lot of computer games. So it's like a classic interface uh, element. And I did this in also yeah, here in, in South Korea, in Seoul, and in many different countries. So it's very interesting to see the different reactions. Over there, it was, uh, people were like super um, shouting the name super loud in the street. It was a student neighborhood. When you do such a thing in, in Berlin, it's like, yeah, whatever, artist project, they don't care. I don't know what it would be like here, but... Um, yeah, this is like, now we come to the, the whole topic which is here in, in the front. It's, it's all about this computer game Counter-Strike and this very special uh, one map of the <coughs> computer game uh, called Dust. A very um, early map in this game. First, we start with these um, pair of glasses. So there's a little shelf over here, and there's this postcard, which is a DI, little DIY set. So everybody can go there, grab a card, and then you can cut these pair of glasses. And you take, right? I mean, it's, it's all about this, this uh, first-person shooter games. And it all started with, like, uh, Wolfenstein. That's like this whole history of 3D games. But, and there's, yeah, of course, important ones. But they have all in common that there's like this, this arm and the weapon like in the screen in the front and when you play the game this is like the transition like this is like a simulation or I'm reaching in virtual space right I'm like I'm it's me like this is my arm in there so it's sort of this concept became very like nobody's questioning this because when you sit in front of a computer like you don't think this is your arm but it's just like a symbolic gesture but at the same time uh, 
yeah, this is like standard for all the games. And in here, like back in 2001, this was just like a, it's just an image. Today, there's like a lot of animation with the arm and the weapon in front. But what would it be like to take this, this view, right, on, on your eyes in the city or in your like everyday life? And how is that, like the connection as a gamer, when you play online, when you play games, when you turn around, talk to people, so it's it's like this this question, um, yeah. And there's like different installations on in different shows, and it's uh, always, of course, I I got these emails from different people, also from kids, like, yeah, I did everything with the glasses, but it's all blurred. It doesn't work for me. So yeah, <laughs> and of course, it's like it's too close to your eyes that it would actually really work. But so therefore, we have a mirror, and you can perceive yourself like as a gaming person or not and also question this whole violence topic like what are you doing in there or is it is it like violent or not so yeah this is also possible to see from both sides and there's many uh, picture galleries of, of people and also people you might know um, wearing these glasses and the whole dust project is uh, so it's like it's all about this this map. The interesting part is, um, oh, for me, I mean this this whole space architectural concept could be also transferred to other gaming maps. But um, I, it's like a personal choice because this is like one of the last games I really played. Also for the first person shooters, it was kind of kind of like an important game because it, it was a modification of the game Half Life, and. It had some new rule sets in there and, and uh, gaming mechanisms which made it very, very popular like 10 years ago. And, and there's still people playing this. And what is, what is interesting that when you play this game, you need to know the space super well to survive in there, to achieve like, to the goal of the game. And, and you end up knowing the space better than actually like when I go to the airport and also the airports I know, like you always get lost or this. this may, I mean, we are trained as humans to remember space and to like have these evolutionary uh, skills, of course. But here it's like, um, and when I come to Ljubljana, I also know how to get downtown and the city and I know the space of the gallery and etc. And then you can pose this question, how many people have seen the Dragon Bridge, like been there, how many people have been in Berlin or in Times Square or Kaaba and Mecca? And how many people have been in this space here? And a lot of people have been in here. And when you go back after 10 years, you know exactly what is behind the door or what is behind this and this uh, crate. And um, so it becomes part of like what I claim is cultural heritage, which, which should be kind of uh, exists. Or I, I, I come to this in a second. So also what you can see that this is pictures from, from the internet. So these, these kids are just reenacting things, what you could do in the game, what, but it doesn't really make sense for some whatever SEALs team or um, also this is the, the map from above. It's, compared to games today, it's, it's a pretty small space. It's not very big. Also, that's why you, yeah, you're able to remember it very well. So this is another picture from what you find on the internet. Then people, kids or a, a clan from Counter-Strike rebuilds this in sand on the beach and not because they have a print with them, but just because they know it. And, and I think the, the, this whole, uh, also this whole strand of work, what I'm doing with like taking objects and gestures from, from digital and move them in physical space and discuss these kind of merging worlds we have today. The gaming, the gaming community is very early in this. They understood this like at the first moment because for them it's like, yeah, it's like the most important space and they spend so much time there. So they started very early pulling these things out and reenacting this. And today, of course, there's like every second commercial has like flying angry birds and stuff. So, but I don't know, like five, seven years ago, this was all still sort of separate. And these places, uh, <laughs> you know, like doing the view. Um, so the, uh, I claim that I want to build this whole map as a as a one to one scale, real life sculpture slash museum. So it's going to be 100 by 110 meter and something like 15 meters in elevation, and it's going to take a lot of time to achieve this. It's like a 
it's like a, to claim to make this. I also already noticed like people like keep asking me, and of course. So it's um, this is like a like a, a far goal, but uh, also a, a dream to see this one. Of, some of these spaces um, which you spend so much time in and which I yeah I claim have like cultural heritage level should be placed or should be built in, in real life and then you have this moment of it becomes like a pilgrim like a like a pilgrim place or at the same time maybe in a couple hundred years people will wonder what this was and like like the sunken temple or stonehenge for like something you, you can't really understand also the architecture is sort of strange because it has all these elements on the outside, which doesn't make sense as a building, but it's only constructed to, to walk in there. So it's for the player, like the, the, the designer of the map is, um, is only making these objects to, to be viewed from inside, but not from outside. So it has this, these weird structures. There's on the outside next to the book, which I'm presenting out there, it's like a, it's a brochure of, the, of uh, Johnston, David Johnston, who's the designer of the map, and he has a whole history of like how to name the, the making of this um, special dust map. And this is the rapid prototype, which is there in front. So I, I started uh, making concrete models in, in bigger scale, and uh, we wanted to, to build three of these big crates here nearby uh, Ljubljana, but the weather conditions didn't allow like to do something with all the snow, so this was postponed. <laughs> but this, there are some, some images, for example, so yeah, a stack of crate, as I said, for me is like a, like a Stonehenge in, in that sense for, for the gaming community. And the plan is to make, this, make these excerpts from the gaming map map in different parts of the world so maybe also the the whole gaming map is sort of scattered over the world this is also an, a more new concept in here most recently i i just came back last week from paris where i had a uh, curated a show and also did a new show concept so that's why i'm also showing the speed show which is called offline art and the idea is um to take net art take it offline and put it on a wi-fi router and the wi-fi router is broadcasting the piece only locally. So it's like it, the piece is actually on a USB drive on this machine and then each machine is dedicated for one artist and then you go to your mobile uh, to your mobile phone and to, the, to your networks and it will list up all the names of the artists and you need to connect to the net network to see then one piece in the browser. And that's all what you can see in the browser. This is like the whole network is just a piece. So this is sort of the yeah, it's, a, it's again like an experiment on how to take, take uh, digital art and in, in a, in a, in a watch it in a different format. Um, the show was very much like this, interestingly. Like, because, I mean, you go to, often you go to places, even whatever, public places when I travel, you see, all, I, I, look, I look at the phone all the time, actually. But also people go to cultural events and still look at their phone because the Facebook stream is more interesting than the concert or whatever happens over there. Here you went to the show and people were supposed to look at their phones. So it was sort of like a very introverted <laughs> show. But at the same time also, yeah, was, uh, it works very well in that sense that you watch this on your private device and then you walk away and, and you don't... You, some, yeah, of course, like some of the pieces are online, other pieces weren't online. So it's really like you, you need to be in this place to see it. And Olya the Alina gave a pretty good opening speech that night talking about this whole topic. So this is like a brand new thing. Um, yeah, I think this is like a good last, last project. Random Screen is something I did in 2005 or six. It's a whole, I, I've done a whole series of, of um, analog pixel screens. And here we're going to watch another video. So that, there's been a lot of, of pixel art and when people see this in the show, like, oh yeah, I know this, like, let's watch, see the next piece. Um, but then there's like the, the backside of the piece, which is interesting to, or yeah, which is important to see, which we will see in a second. So each pixel is, is actually run by a tea candle light 
And on top of this tea candle light is like a, a beer can, which is like modified to a, to a fan. And it's, it's turning, it's spinning by the raising heat of the candle, which is it's like a very classic Christmas thing, right? <laughs> but in the front, it's just pixel going on and off. So it has like these both sides of like being very digital from what we understand or what we think is digital language, pixels. And at the same time, on the back, you have uh, fire, which is, uh, yeah, one of the very basic old elements. And that's a good example of, of, uh, of these two, two sides. I like to, yeah, look projects from, from uh, what I like to look projects at and how to, you know, for example, here, then it still shows that I, you stand there and it's like the technician from the next piece and they keep asking me like, yeah, but how do you control all these little motors in there? I'm like, yeah, there are no motors in there. Like, <laughs> it's really hard to understand like in the field or like when we, we, have, we have so much technology around us and, and there's certain language, how technology looks like and then you cannot like disconnect it anymore. It's like, oh yeah, this has to be digital. Like, so this is like, a, yeah, it's a very good explanation on what I like to work on. And that's the website and also the end of my talk and we have, yeah, Q&A would be great. <laughs>